Good afternoon everyone and welcome to today's WorkSafe Tasmania Month webinar Office Ergonomics and Introduction to Workstation Assessment. I'm Stephanie from WorkSafe Tasmania and also the coordinator of WorkSafe Tasmania Month. I'll also be your moderator for uh, for this afternoon's session as well. And uh, just up front, I uh, just would like to let you know that um, we are playing some videos uh, during uh, this afternoon's webinar. Um, they will run a little slow, unfortunately, so if you could just bear with us, um, they, they will be watchable, um, but um, they're not perfect. <laughs> so if you could bear with us when we do play those videos. Um, so before we do go um, and start this afternoon's presentation, I just appreciate you taking a few moments to read through the following slide about information delivered during WorkSafe Month sessions. So I'll now go through a few items so you know how to interact with this afternoon's session. So you'll see an example um, of the attendee interface on your screen. You should uh, hopefully see something that looks like this um, on your screen in the upper right hand corner. You're most likely listening in using your computer's uh, speaker system by default. However, if you would prefer to uh, join over the phone, please just do select telephone in the audio pane and the dialing information will be displayed. You will also have the opportunity, sorry, to submit uh, questions to today's presenter. So please do type those questions into the questions pane uh, in the control panel on the right hand side. Um, please do send those questions in at any time during the presentation. We will address those questions um, at the end of today's webinar. We are also recording webinars during WorkSafe Tasmania Month um, and we'll progressively make those webinars available on the WorkSafe site um, at the end of WorkSafe Month, which does conclude uh, this Friday. So if there's anything else in, in uh, the program that you uh, haven't uh, signed up for, we do have another, another webinar running tomorrow morning and we end WorkSafe Month uh, this year with um, the uh, Rivulet run with uh, Ronald Young Builders. So if you are interested in any of those activities, please do head to the, the WorkSafe TAS website. And lastly, before you do leave today's webinar, you will receive a, a short survey on uh, on the presentation. We certainly do appreciate uh, you taking the time to give us your feedback about uh, your webinar experience um, and also about today's uh, presentation. So I would now like to uh, welcome our presenter for this afternoon, Michelle Watson from Tasmanian Health Service uh, South to present this afternoon's webinar Office Ergonomics and Introduction to Workstation Assessment. Welcome Michelle. Thanks Stephanie. Welcome everyone. Um, this is an introduction to Workstation Assessment. Before we get into the presentation, I'd just like to clarify that I'm a registered nurse. I'm not a qualified ergonomist. I do have an interest in ergonomics and I have done a course through the University of Queensland and part of my employment involves conducting workstation assessments on a regular basis. So why do we conduct workstation assessments? Well, I guess the main reason is because it assists employers to meet their obligations to provide a safe work environment as per the WHS Act. Um, we do it so we can avoid mismatches of individuals to their work and work environment and we do it um, to encourage a good working posture by eliminating problems. This has a flow on effect that leads to a reduced rate of chronic injuries and sick leave. It has a positive impact on productivity due to the benefits of good work posture and reduced illness and injury. It reduces human error that can sometimes come from strain and fatigue in poor work environments and when there are mismatches of a person to their workstation or work environment. Also has the flow on effect of a reduced cost to the organisation from the burden of illness 
injury and workers' compensation claims. And my favourite point is that it also results in good morale. Uh, it gives people the feeling that they're cared about, that the organisation wants to help them. When should you conduct a workstation assessment? Well, consider doing them as part of a new employee induction. Being proactive stops uh, the problems before they start. I think that any employee should be able to request a review of their workstation to have assistance in setting up the best layout or to help if they are experiencing issues such as body stress and pain. Also, employees returning to work after illness, injury or surgery might need some help with adjustments to accommodate any restrictions in their abilities when they come back to work and that's one of the things that I get involved in as well. So how do you conduct the assessment? Well, I guess it's ideal to have someone to conduct the assessment who can give the person being assessed at their workstation, uh, you know, time to view them. Self-assessment is possible but it has restrictions. An independent assessor is more likely to identify problems that aren't readily apparent to the workstation user. It's easier to see what's going on when you're not actually living, living it. So someone who's actually viewing what's going on. You need a checklist or an audit tool. Now there's lots of these available on the internet but I should just let you know that they need to be based on current standards. So if you're going to look for something off the internet, just be aware that we have a standards in Australia and um, you need to base your audit tool around the standards. Today's presentation is based on the checklist used in my organisation and a copy will be made available to you uh, through this presentation. So you can have a look at it and maybe you can adapt it to your needs. Um, Tools that I take along when I do an assessment, I always take a builder's tape measure because it's handy for measuring the desktop, the height, the width, leg room. Uh, I use it to check the fit before rearranging furniture and also for measuring if you're going to order custom made items. I take a camera so you can take pictures, so a mobile phone is fine or an iPad or just a camera if that's what you have. I use the pictures in the report I find it's handy, uh, particularly if you're going to look at a problem that needs rectifying, that needs some money spent on it, it's good to have something to show managers. And time. You need to allow at least 30 minutes for an assessment and keep in mind that a difficult or involved case will probably take longer, sometimes up to an hour. You need to make sure that the person that you're doing the assessment on will have free time. So it's no good trying to do an assessment on someone who's still answering phones or working at a reception desk. Factors that influence a working posture, and this comes from uh, a textbook on an introduction to ergonomics by Bridger. It's fairly current. So we look at personal characteristics, so age, body weight, fitness, any existing musculoskeletal problems, whether there's been a previous injury or surgery, eyesight, um, whether they're left or right handed and uh, whether they're obese or uh, even to the other extreme whether they're lightweight. We look at the task requirements, so things like visual requirements, manual requirements, uh, positional requirements of the job, forces that might be applied to the body during the work, the cycle times of the work, whether there's rest periods and whether the work is paced or unpaced. And we look at work design space, so seat dimensions, the work surface dimensions, seat design, the workspace dimensions and these include things like headroom, legroom, footroom, uh, whether there's privacy or privacy required, the illumination levels um, in the room where they're working and there's one missing from there, there should also be the temperature. You need to be working in a comfortable environment. So that brings us to the postural triangle um, and that summarises the interactions between the requirements of the workspace design, uh, the task 
and the personal characteristics of the worker. And as you can see from the diagram, that gives us the working posture. What we want to achieve by doing these assessments is a good working posture. Good working posture minimises work fatigue, strain injuries that lead to musculoskeletal disorders are also uh, minimised with a good working posture. What we're aiming for is a posture that is as close to uh, neutral alignment of the body as possible. We want to avoid long periods of stretching or straining. So I mentioned the standards before and I'm just going to show you these but I'm not going to talk through them. You just need to be aware that we have Australian and ISI standards that um, give us the minimum requirements for things in uh, office design. So that brings us to our checklist. As I mentioned before, this is a tool that I currently use in my organisation. Uh, there are 10 points to work through and any answers in the negative will require some action or adjustments to be made. So that's just um, you know, the biggest flag, I guess. Any time you answer no, you're going to have to do something about that. Point one is all about the organisation of the employee's activities in their daily work. As you can see, you're required to estimate the percentage of time spent on tasks to provide some insight into the resources and movements required by the job. Then you examine the variety, the control, the consistency and the ability to take breaks. As I said before, any answers in the negative are a, fla a flag that there could be problems with the position and that you're likely going to need to make some changes. Okay, so this is our first little uh, video. I just want to let you know that there's no sound to this video except right at the end where there's a little bit of advertising for Powtoon who created it. Um, I just think uh, it's a good little reminder built into the first part of the checklist where we talk about taking pauses and breaks. So I'll just start playing now and hope, hopefully you can hear what's going on. using Bowtoon. Thanks. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, sorry about that. It's a little bit um, daunting, this technology, and getting your head around it. So when I do assessments, I always reinforce the message of the micro break. Now we're going to have a look at the chair. It's point two on the checklist, but before we look at the checklist, I think we should run through um, good points to know about a chair and what a good chair design looks like. So I've put a picture on there of a chair that's a fairly modern one that has multiple adjustments and um, I think if we just run through and have a quick look at the main points, it should have five star base. It ideally should be completely adjustable. Um, the seat pan height should adjust. 
the backrest height should adjust. Uh, there should be an adequate profile lumbar support. Armrests must be adjustable if you're going to have them, otherwise it's best not to have them. A seat pan slide for seat depth, that's a fairly new thing for chairs and it's really great because it allows an adjustment for leg length. The seat pan tilt and casters, if you're using your chair on a hardwood floor, you need to have um, a friction casters. And I just wanted to make the point that I see a lot of fit balls around. People use them to sit on when they're working. They're not really acceptable as task chairs. Uh, they're not good for, for long-term use when you're trying to do tasks, all right for short term. Okay, so before we go on to the checklist, we'll have a quick look at adjusting a chair. This is something that you have to do quite frequently if you're doing workstation assessments and it's good to know how to do. So you stand in front of the chair and adjust the seat pan height so the highest point of the seat is just below the kneecap. Then you sit on the chair with your feet flat on the floor. The clearance between the front edge of the seat and the bend of the knee, which is the circle in the diagram, needs to be about two to three finger width space. If the chair is fitted with a slider mechanism that I just talked about, you adjust the seat length. The backrest. You adjust the back rest, hopefully it has a forwards and backwards tilt on it as well as up and down so that it fits the hollow of the lower back. Um, sit upright with your arms hanging loosely at your sides, and bend your elbows at around 90 degrees and adjust the armrest, the height until it barely touches the underside of your elbows. If you can't do that and um, if the chair can't be put into uh, the desk close enough, then you need to take those armrests off, they're in the way and they're not helping. The seat pan tilt, when you're sitting in the seat you just release the pan tilt lever and tilt yourself either forwards or backwards till you find a comfortable spot and then you lock it in position. Once you've done all that, then you need to take the chair to the workstation and make sure that it fits properly with the workstation. So. With the person sitting in the chair, they should be able to get their legs comfortably under the desk. If they can't fit their legs under the workstation or there's not enough space to move freely, then the workstation's too low. Um, if their arms need to be elevated in order to place them over the workstation, it's too high. Adjust the um, chair height so the elbows are the same height as the work surface. Now, once you've done that, their feet are probably not going to reach the floor, that's when you look at bringing in a, fit, a foot rest and a foot rest needs to be fully adjustable. Okay, so that takes us back to the chair and um, as you can see there's a series of questions regarding the type of the chair and the chair adjustments which we've just run through looking at how to adjust your chair and that's why you need to become familiar with uh, how the chair works and what you need to do to correct it if there's a negative response to any of the questions. I won't run through the questions because basically we've just been through them with chair adjusting but the picture on the side shows you the, the angles that we're kind of looking for. Point three is to do with the desk or the workstation. And the questions are fairly simple. Is the desk adequate to the task? Is the height reasonable for the stature of the user? Is there adequate room under the desk for the user's legs? Are the user's forearms parallel with the desk? The picture um, on the side there just shows you the minimum measurements required per the standards. Um, and that is actually straight off the checklist, so it's there to guide you when you go and do your assessment. Point four is the computer. Now the computer deals with um, the monitor or screen, the keyboard and the mouse and we'll take each part separately. First up is the monitor and the questions are around the positioning. So is the monitor directly in front of and at a comfortable distance from the user? That's usually about an arm's length but it can vary depending on a person's visual acuity. 
is the top of the monitor adjusted to the user's height? The top of the screen needs to be about eye level or slightly below. And if the person wears multifocals, just remember that the screen probably will need to be a little bit lower to allow for their lenses. What we're looking for is um, neutral alignment of the neck. Is the screen free from glare and reflection? It's usually an easy fix here, uh, just using curtains or blinds to control the amount of light. You can maybe move the furniture around or uh, invest in a screen filter. There's questions there about laptops. So if you're using a laptop, it should be set up with a separate monitor. The laptop monitors are really too small for sitting at for full-time work. And if the person's using dual screens, they need to be located side by side, slightly angled towards one another um, to reduce the twisting that you have to do to view the screens. And if one of the screens is used more frequently, that screen needs to be centred in front of the worker and the keyboard. So now we're looking at the keyboard. Fairly basic questions. Is the keyboard close to the front of the desk, directly at the uh, front of the user? Are the keyboard feet lowered unless the person is a touch typist? And if you're using a laptop, as with the, the screen, you need a separate keyboard. Uh, the little picture on the right is um, showing you what we're looking for in correct posture for the hands, wrists, arms. And uh, the green is the correct, of course, and the red is wrong. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory, but it's amazing how many times I see people trying to sit and type in a twisted position and they just don't realise that that's the cause of their sore arms and wrists. Now we're looking at the mouse. Again, we're looking for neutral posture of the arm, wrist and hand. Uh, questions are straightforward and designed to flag any postural issues. There's a lot of different um, computer mice on the market and my advice would be to check them out. I think you just need to be aware that not everything that says it's ergonomic actually is. Um, I often saw, uh, see people trying to use the mouse way out to the side and away from the midline of their body and this causes a lot of strain and leads to neck and shoulder and arm and wrist disorders. And that's why the last question on that slide is highlighted in yellow. I think it's one of the most important questions and uh, it's one that has a fairly easy solution and uh, by you know, implementing some changes there we can do better with pain and get a better posture. So um, by moving the mouse to the midline and um, keeping your arm closer to the body you can eliminate a lot of pain issues and strain issues. I've included on the slide a picture of my most favoured vertical mouse. The mouse that you see there allows the arm and hand to remain in a neutral alignment rather than having a twisted arm, which happens when you use a conventional mouse. This is um, a piece of equipment that I recommend to a lot of people that are experiencing wrist and um, neck and shoulder pain. It's quite successful, it just takes a little bit of getting used to. Another thing you can do is look at changing the keyboard for a smaller version without a number pad and that allows you to keep the mouse closer to the midline. If the person however needs to use a number pad frequently, you could look at a keyboard that has the numeric pad located on the opposite side to their mouse arm or you can look at keyboards that have separate numeric pads so that you can just put it out of the way when you're actually typing and just bring it in front of you when you're looking um, at data entry that needs numbers. There's a whole lot of solutions out there. Uh, you just need to become familiar with what's available in computer hardware. Okay, so we've got another little um, video. This one doesn't have any talking on it. It's just got a few sound effects. So hopefully we'll see how we go with, with this one.
Thanks, Stephanie. Okay, that was just a little summary of what we've seen so far, um, and I just thought it was a cute way of doing it. Uh, now we're up to point five on our checklist, which is all to do with the desktop. So what we're looking at is to see that the frequently used items are within easy reach of the worker and that appropriate aids are being used to avoid strain from twisting movements of the neck, head and shoulders. So just looking to see that they're using document holders or slope boards to help them um, you know, when they're uh, typing or, or when they're looking at um, you know, thick files that might need supporting while they're typing information from it. And the picture on the right of the screen just shows you that um, there are three zones. The most frequently used items should be located in the grey zone and then you have your secondary and tertiary zones where you put things that are less used in the secondary zone and things that are seldom used in the tertiary zone. So the questions on the side of, of the slide there are all to do with, um, you know, the appropriate use of aids. I'm not going to read them all, but what I would like to talk a little bit about is the telephone. It is really important to have it located on the opposite side to the dominant hand um, to allow for the sharing of a workload between both sides of the body, uh, particularly as most people use their dominant hand for the mouse. So if you use the phone frequently, um, you should also consider a headset. Um, this kind of helps discourage the phone being cradled between the neck and shoulder, which is really bad and leads to a lot of um, musculoskeletal problems, particularly if it's done on a regular basis. The other thing is that if you have a headset, it gives you the mobility to get up and move around, which is really good because we don't want to be sitting for too long, but you can still actually engage in um, speaking on the phone uh, and it adds to a little bit of variation in what you, you do. You're not stuck anchored to the desk. So two really important points. Try and have the phone on the non-dominant side and if the phone is something that's used a lot, then consider a headset. Sitting posture, well, this is really just a recap of what we've already covered with the chair adjustments and it's just a quick run through those sorts of questions around the adjustment of the chair um, and the person, person's posture while they're sitting at the desk. And again it says, um, if you answer no to any of the questions, you might have to go back and review previous points to make adjustments. Standing posture. Standing posture really relates to people that are using a standing or a sit and stand workstation. Um, it describes the correct standing posture and um, the same principles apply here as for sitting at a desk with regard to the height adjustment for the arms. You've got to make sure that there is no strain so you're still looking at that 90 degree bend at the elbow. So you need to make sure if you're using a standing workstation that the height is, is right for the user. In my work I get more and more requests for workstation assessments from people who are keen to get a sit and stand desk. These things are really expensive, a motorised one retails at around about $1200. I think at the moment it is a little bit of a fad, although it is good not to be sedentary. The key message here is that um, it's a mixture of sitting and standing and you don't actually need to have a standing desk to do that. You just need to remember to mix, mix your tasks and avoid static posture. So you need to take your micro breaks, you need to get up and move as often as you can and think outside the square with what you're doing in your work practice so things like walking meetings and um, as I mentioned before the telephone headset that allows you to get up and, uh, up and down. However, there are some people who do require a sit and stand workstation and it's usually due to some kind of musculoskeletal disorder or injury that requires them to be able to get up and stand for part of the day. The main thing to understand is that standing can also become a static posture 
and that can lead to other health issues. The benefits really come from changing postures. So that's just the key message there. Okay, so that now brings us to sedentary work, which is point eight on our checklist. And that examines the worker's ability to move around or mix tasks rather than sitting at the workstation continuously. So the series of questions there are really based around that. And again, I'm not going to go through the questions. What I want to mention is there are Australian guidelines which include recommendations on sedentary behaviour and these are particularly important for those working in an office environment. There really are only two. One is to minimise the amount of time spent in prolonged sitting and two is to break up long periods of sitting as often as possible. Uh, I'll just tell you that further information on sedentary including the current research data can be accessed from www comcare.gov.au and now I want to show you a short video which was put together by the Chiropractors Association of Australia in 2010 and um, it's really interesting the facts um, and figures at that time on sedentary behaviour. work in an office. Facts may surprise you. The Chiropractors Association of Australia recently looked into this very issue. It turns out that the average Australian office worker, after sleeping for 429 minutes, will rise and then sit to commute for 81 minutes in total. At work, they will sit working without a computer for 97 minutes. But for the majority of their office time, they will sit at a computer for 337 minutes, over five and a half hours. At home, they will continue to sit at a computer for work for another 71 minutes, and then sit at their home computer for personal use for 115 minutes. They will sit for other leisure activities for 102 minutes. And finally, they will sit watching television for 132 minutes, or nearly two and a quarter hours. So what about the other things they do during the day? What about things like standing, walking, running, going out for lunch, cooking, watering the garden, washing up, grabbing a few groceries from the shops? How much time is left for that? just over 73 minutes. That's right, on an average working day, there's only one hour and 13 minutes left to stand, walk and exercise. Just one hour and 13 minutes. It's a fact worth making a stand about. For more information, visit sitright.com.au. Okay, very interesting, one hour and 13 minutes, we need to use it wisely. Um, I usually take the opportunity to talk to people when I do the sedentary work part of the checklist about whether they have uh, reminders set to help them to remember to get up and move and that's easily uh, done in Outlook or sometimes we use a program called Exatime software which um, cues people to get up and, and take breaks and can also run them through some exercises. So now we go to point nine which is back care and it's pretty straightforward. The questions um, are just around whether a person has had manual handling um, education for the tasks they're doing, whether they've had training or education on back care if it's required, do they have suitable aids in place to help them for manual tasks? And if they're able to maintain natural and relaxed posture, providing opportunity for movement through um, alternative positions in their work day. There's a little picture there just showing a nice straight posture in a chair. That brings us to 
point 10 which is all about the work environment. Um, so I guess what we're looking at is that the environment's adequate to the workers' needs. So do they have sufficient storage space at the workstation? Uh, one of the things you'll see quite often is people poking things under their desk and then they can't get their legs and feet under or their chair under the desk properly. So that's a big consideration. It seems like a, a, a fairly simple question, but uh, it's often interesting what comes out of that one. Looking at um, trip hazards and clear areas around the floor, uh, I went into an office the other day that had piles of um, paper spread out everywhere on the floor and um, you couldn't really walk around safely. Um, sharp corners on furniture and you know adequate space to move around, electrical connections and cords in a good and safe condition. Um, the other thing to look at is the lighting. Um, we talked about that a little bit before regarding the monitor and glare, but also is the illumination in the room adequate and um, is reflection and glare kept to a minimum? And does the worker find the level of noise comfortable and conductive, um, uh, sorry, conducive to concentration? Some areas I've been in have been uh, very poorly designed or are located in high traffic areas and not suitable for the work that they're doing. Uh, and does the worker find the air temperature and airflow comfortable? So once you get to the end of your checklist, you're faced with the identifying of follow-up actions. Usually what you do is put it all into a table and um, then you figure out what needs to be done, what that's going to involve and uh, suitable dates to have it done by. There's a big a bold thing on the screen there that says is a professional assessment required. Well, I, it, on the checklist that I use, there's a couple of flags there about when you might consider bringing in a professional. And my rule of thumb is usually that I do the assessments and I try out a few things and um, give a person you know, a reasonable time to trial some new things up to a month. And if I'm not getting any joy, then I might look at whether we need to bring in a professional ergonomist. It costs money to do that and um, you just want to be sure that they're going to be able to uh, provide some fixes if you're going to spend the money. So usually what you do with the 10 point checklist covers a lot of things that an ergonomist will do anyway. Um, so uh, yeah, I guess the rule of thumb is don't spend the money if you don't need to, but if you're not um, getting satisfaction from what you've tried, then you need to consider other aven avenues and an ergonomist is one of them. Uh, on our checklist, we have a thing there that says obtain advice and assistance from your WHS consultant. We're lucky enough to have one. Um, if you have one in your organisation, then that would also be a person that you would talk to about a case that you're having difficulties with. Okay, I've got two um, short little videos that I made. I have to apologise for the quality of them. I hope I don't make you seasick, but they were just filmed using um, my uh, handheld recorder and I'm not a professional. So um, one is a before of a workstation that I use and one is an after. So hopefully they work all right. His fingers crossed, here we go. Hi everyone, welcome to the Occupational Health Nurse Clinic Room at the Royal Hobart Hospital. Uh, I just want to say first up, I'm not a professional videoer, so please bear with me. I hope I don't make you seasick, but I wanted to share this little video with you of our clinic room so that you could have a look at the configuration of a challenging workstation. So then as you walk into the room, it becomes an L shape and in the L shape we have a desk that fits into there. So I'll just run through the configuration of the workstation. So to the left hand side is the patient chair. It'll return on the corner of the desk. Some um, drawers underneath the desk as well as 
a whole lot of things living under here which I'll just show you that shouldn't be here. So we have managed to um, accumulate over time various eskies and containers for transporting vaccines, uh, extra stationary supplies, place in the corner where we put our bags when we come in. And then up on the desk, at the back of the desk, there is a um, shelving arrangement that runs and follows the corner of the room. Okay, uh, on the desk, telephone to the right, uh, some various bits of stationery that we use in our work, standard keyboard and mouse, a computer monitor which happens to be standing on a telephone directory to try and raise it to a better height, and further trays of stationery and supplies that we use. On the shelf above that, is located our printer, which is uh, reasonably handy to our uh, computer area. It's a little bit more um, stationary being stored in the corner. A second computer monitor, so you can see that arrangement there. A telephone directory, then above that, further shelving with folders that are sort of used in our work some extra sharps containers and bits and pieces that um, we have managed to find a place for. Some folders there that we use in our consulting work with our patients. Now I thought it would be worthwhile showing you the patient perspective, so I will just move around here and sit down as though we were a patient so, uh, so that you can see. So basically you can see where the nurse sits. Now at the moment what you can see is the chair well out from, from the desk which when the nurse is talking to the patient has to happen and then they have to twist around to talk to them. Okay, now let's go and sit in the office chair and have a look from the nurse's perspective. So I've now sat in the chair and turned it so that I can actually talk to my patient. Then if I need to, which we do, put any information into the computer, then we then have to swivel the chair around. So as I'm facing the computer, I'll turn the camera to where the patient is sitting and looking at me so that you can get the idea. So this is now um, at 90 degrees to where I'm sitting and you can see that it presents some challenges. Also thought we should have a look at the chair which is, um, excuse me while I get up and move back so that we can get a view of it. Once again just having a look at that workstation which telephone to the right, computer monitors, the hard drive is tucked in the corner behind the monitor and more paperwork, printer, etc. So we'll revisit this workstation um, further into the presentation and uh, we might have a, a look at what would be a better arrangement. Here we are once again in the clinic room which has had its makeover. As you can see we have the two screens lined up side by side on the same surface now which is much better for neck posture. Uh, we can see the patient when we're talking to them quite easily and also our computer screen so there's no twisting required there. The screens are set at the same height. The print has been moved down to a lower level and we've uh, gotten rid of some excess shelving and cleaned up what was on the higher shelves to make uh, things a little bit more functional. And as we pan around you can see that a lot of things are still where they were although we have a little bit more streamlined arrangement and we have much more 
service to work with on the desk. The telephone is closer to the screen. Unfortunately, we couldn't locate it on the left-hand side because we use the left-hand side to see clients. Underneath the desk, you can see it's all nice and clean and free, and there's plenty of leg room now to use either side of the workstation. And uh, we also did away with the paper shredder, and as you can see, the drawers have been moved to the right-hand side. So that's our little office arrangement. The paper shredder is gone. We now walk down the hallway, which is good to get us up and moving to get rid of our secure documents. Okay, so I hope that made sense to you. Um, I'd just like to say that that um, makeover didn't cost us anything and we actually have a much more functional um, workspace which everybody seems to enjoy far more than the old setup. All right, so on the screen in front of you now, you will be looking at a slide that's got lots of little pictures on it. I just thought it would be worth um, chatting a little bit about um, some of the things that I have or have managed to um, accumulate to use as um, aids when I go and see people. So again, you'll see there's a picture there of the mouse that I like, uh, the vertical mouse. I have one of those in my um, loan equipment. I also have a trackball mouse which um, suits some people for different problems that they might be having as a loan equipment. I have a small keyboard similar to the one you can see on your screen which I use to trial for people that are having trouble with neck, shoulder, arm and wrist. Um, and also I have one of those very special very desk units uh, that are a cheaper alternative to a sit-stand desk unit and I loan that out for a period of one month at a time as a trial for people um, and um, if it works then we look at whether we can afford to purchase it for them. There's a picture there that says Dragon Medical Speech Recognition Software. I've used um, the software for someone who has come back from work after neck surgery and they used to um, do a lot of typing in their job and uh, in order to maintain their role they now use the Dragon Speak software which works very well for them. There's a little picture of the Exatime icon which I mentioned before for um, software that you load onto your computer to remind you to take breaks at, and uh, is uh, very useful. You don't actually have to do exercises with it, but it can be set up just to remind you to get up and move. And on the top left of the screen, you'll see there's a little blue um, picture that says I Auditor. That's my new favourite toy. I actually downloaded that app for free to my iPad and um, have been given a uh, template for a 10-point workstation checklist, which is largely um, based on the one that I've just run through with you guys. Uh, and that was created by someone in my organisation in the northwest of the state for work health and safety audits, which is slightly different to my focus. Uh, but it's fantastic. I can do my audits as I go, just type a tapping in the answers to the uh, questions on the iPad and at the end of it all it produces a lovely PDF report which I then email to myself and on to the manager and the person that I've done the assessment with. It also has the ability to uh, put the photos that you take while you're there with your device straight into your report. So I'd recommend um, that you look at those sorts of things if you're going to be doing a lot of um, these types of audits. Also, I just wanted to quickly run through with you some um, things that you might run into. I see a lot of people who share or hot desk workstations and one of the main things you have to remind people who do that is that they need to take a couple of minutes at the start of their working shift each time to readjust the workstation to suit them. If they don't, they're just going to have the same issues that they have had before. Um, sometimes you need to order specialised equipment 
um, I do order some things from a plastics company like slopes for documents and sometimes I order a, a platform arrangement to sit screens on so that um, computer hard drives will slide in underneath um, and it gives a little bit more desk room and uh, actually gets the screens to the exact height that we need. It's always good to remind people to tidy their workstations as you saw with the eskies in the video, um, things like that that don't need to be there can actually cause problems and small changes uh, can really uh, you know, cost you nothing and um, result in um, a much happier physical body. Uh, getting employees to adopt recommend changes can be difficult but usually people who contact me are having difficulties so they're willing to try anything. It's just plugging away the same with changes of any kind in an organisation. And um, if you have the ability I would um, suggest that a loan equipment scheme is a good thing to have. And that's it for my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. I'll hand you back to Stephanie. All right, and thank you very much, Michelle, for uh, your presentation today, Office Ergonomics and Introduction to Workstation Assessment. Um, there is still time for uh, any questions, so um, if anyone does uh, have something they would like to uh, ask Michelle, then please do type your questions into the questions pane on the right-hand side. Michelle, one question that has uh, come in, what is the recommended, um, sorry, what is the light, light level recommended for workstations where a lot of detailed paperwork needs to be read as well as uh, using the computer for, for CAD work, for example, um, a drafting office? I couldn't tell you the exact recommendation. I suggest you have a look um, on Mr Google. Google's full of all sorts of wonderful information um, to find the standard. But if you're doing work where you're reading detailed documents and you're also using a computer screen, then I recommend that you have a desk lamp that you can use to illuminate your paperwork. That usually um, stops the problem of straining your eyes for the document, but it also doesn't increase glare on your, on your computer screen. Hopefully that helps you. All right, thanks Michelle. Another question that has come through, um, if you're able to uh, possibly tell us, what was the brand name of the keyboard on the last slide? I can't tell you the brand name because it was really just an image that I, I looked for that was similar to the one that I have as a loan uh, equipment. If you would like to contact me, anybody who wants to um, ask any more detailed questions about equipment, I will give you my um, email address. Um, I think probably the best thing is if you've got a pen handy, I'll just um, say it now and you can write it down. So I'm michelle.watson, that's M-I-C-H-E double L-E dot Watson, W-A-T-S-O-N, the numeral one after that, and I'm at T-H-S dot TAS, T-A-S dot gov, G-O-V dot A-U. And I'm quite happy to um, have people email me with any questions if you would like to know the exact brand of a good small keyboard, then I'm, I'm happy to, to give you that. I have all that information back at my office. All right, thanks Michelle. So, thank you Michelle for your uh, webinar this afternoon, Office Ergonomics and Introduction to uh, Workstation Assessment. So again, thank you to uh, Michelle Watson from Tasmanian Health Service South uh, for her presentation. Um, again, when you do leave today's Sorry, when you do leave today's webinar, you will receive a, a short survey on the presentation. We do appreciate you taking a few moments just to let us know uh, uh, your feedback on the presentation itself and also your webinar experience.
So on behalf of WorkSafe Tasmania and our presenter today, Michelle, we uh, thank you for joining us and we hope that you have a, uh, a great, safe and healthy rest of the day. Thank you, Michelle.